wheels this week, Jeff travels to Stafford to visit the annual Japanese Classic Bike Show. Here you'll find machines that you used to thrash around on in your youth, looking better now than the day they were built. Also this week we take a look at Kajiva's latest offering in the popular naked street bike class, the Baby Raptor, 650cc of very usable Suzuki power. In the past on two wheels we've occasionally been accused of showing favouritism to big fancy superbikes. They're nice to look at, they're great fun to ride, but for some people they're simply too expensive. And if you save up all your hard earned cash and buy the bike then you've got the problem of insurance and some of these things are just uninsurable these days. So I'm here to prove that you can have just as much fun on a much smaller machine. So say hello to this, this is the latest Raptor from Kajiva. Believe it or not, there are only 650cc down there, but I can tell you it's just as much fun as any big fancy superbike. And the 650cc in this machine are supplied by Suzuki. In fact, the motor has been lifted straight out of Suzuki's well-respected SV650. The styling is, well, unusual, but if that's not quite wild enough, then there's always the 650 V-Raptor, which for an extra £400 or so, has even more odd-shaped bodywork. Aggressive looks combined with a motor with plenty of poke, but not quite so much that it scares you to death. So here we have it then, Italian style or Italian flair with Japanese engineering, or should I say Japanese reliability. Dead easy to spot the Italian bits, isn't it? You can spot them a mile off. It's all the styling bits, all the all the pointer bits, all the all the daft bits, really, all the off the wall styling, I suppose you might call it. And of course the frame as well, this open trellis style frame, not unlike a Ducati Monster. In fact, not unlike Yamaha's TRX 850, which you might remember came out a few years ago. That had a frame, or still got a frame, just like that. That was a parallel twin. This, of course, is a V twin, and it says down there, Kajiva. Don't be fooled by that. This is not a Kajiva engine, it's a Suzuki 650cc motor. But Suzuki aren't the only people that have had a hand in this because it's got a few other bits and pieces that they've, uh, they've borrowed or they've, uh, they've acquired from other, other people. The uh, rear shock down there is a monoshock, it's a Sax unit that's a Sax monoshock. You might remember Sax from many years ago, famous engine builders and of course they're making bikes now. But it's got some nice touches, I mean there's braided hoses all over it, so I mean lots of people fit these braided hoses as aftermarket accessories, but uh, but they're all on this as standard. Of course we've got Brembo brakes front and rear, so uh, we know the stopping power is going to be uh, certainly going to be up to the job. But if you stood back and just looked at this bike, I mean it's not a small bike, it's 650 cc's, yes, but it could actually pass for a thousand cc because it's no different really to the 1000 cc Raptor uh, physically it's not much different the biggest giveaway and the easiest way to spot it if you get two in a car park and you're not sure what it is is have a look down the front because on this one there's no oil cooler which on the thousand cc motor is mounted down there around there somewhere so there's an oil cooler on the thousand there's none on the 650 and of course these tailpipes as well Nice upswept tailpipes either side. They're a little bit smaller, of course, because a smaller motor, so we don't need great big fat tailpipes. And the biggest giveaway of all is when you do this. When you start it up, listen to this. Not quite got the same roar of a 1000cc V twin, has it? But never mind, it's still an awful lot of fun. and fun is the key word for this style of bike. Forget top speeds, forget lap times and all of that. You'll still arrive on time and you'll have had just as much fun along the way at much lower speeds than the race replica brigade. Don't be fooled into thinking then that this is not a capable machine. With zero wind protection things can still get pretty exciting, believe me. Handling is more than good enough, with the wide and fairly flat bars giving a nice relaxed riding position, while still allowing you to flick the bike quite easily around the country lanes. Well I've said lots of good things about this, uh, this baby Raptor up to now, so uh, how about a few bad things? Well, here we go too bad really, not too many bad things, but one thing I did notice, I won't say it's a bad thing, when I first jumped on it, the uh, pegs, I noticed that they were quite high actually, and if, if like me, I like to ride with the balls of my foot on the pegs like that, sort of almost racing style I suppose, and it means that your leg is quite well bent, you've got quite a nasty bend here in your knees, so depending on uh, how physically fit you are, you might well get achy knees after a few hours in the saddle. 
And then onto this other bit, the pillion bit. What about the pillion? Well, I've not actually been out pillion riding on this, I have to confess, but uh, what about the pillion seat? Well, there isn't much of the pillion seat. I have to say, the foot pegs aren't bad, actually, so uh, you're not going to get achy legs, but there isn't very much to sit on. And with it being a step seat, the pillion is higher than the rider seat, so I'm quite well up in the air now here, so I'd be getting a big wind blast in my face, so I don't think I'd like to go too far on this as a pillion rider. Another thing that... Uh, I wouldn't say it annoys me, but um, it took a little bit of getting used to is this side stand here. Because what happens, I was tending to catch my boot on this side stand here, and I was just catching it on the uh, on the gears there. I suppose it's one of them things you get, get used to eventually, but uh, I just found it, I don't know, a little bit awkward, but uh, no big deal. And another thing, the thing I hate is this colour. Ooh, it's horrible, isn't it? A kind of yellowy thingy don't know what the official name for it is i wouldn't I dread to think what it is but uh, i didn't have a choice in that that's uh, that's how it arrived so uh, can't complain about that it is available in other colors so don't worry you don't have to have a yellow one so why should you buy one of these well a lot of people are buying this style of bike now this kind of naked style of bike in, in not very big uh, cc's you know 650 as i say is plenty enough to have a lot of fun because the problem is on your r1s and your fire blades and your cbrs and your r6s and all that it's quite easy to be doing 100 mile an hour plus 120 130 before you even know it because you've got decent sort of wind protection they're all fully fared and they're so capable they do it so easy this thing 70 mile an hour you know you're doing 70 mile an hour it will do over 100 quite easily 120 thereabouts and it'll cruise along all day at 90 miles an hour and on this style of bike surely 90 mile an hour is fast enough for anyone break is Now, classic bikes and classic bikes in the rain for all that, but classic bikes, what do they mean to you? Is it just a collection of old bikes or is it something truly classy? Well, let's go inside out of this rain and find out. Fourteen twenty-eight. That's fourteen twenty-eight cc. Now this isn't a bike that you'd normally see in a classic show, but it really is classy. Some classy engineering work. It's a Martec frame. Just look at all this aluminium tubing there. Really looks the business. It's turbocharged, which is why you've got the carb stuck up right up there. Beautiful swing arm there, and look at the WP forks. Billet caliper down the front there. A real snazzy looking. This only got second in show, would you believe? But you mustn't miss at the back there, there's a neat little lump number plate, just a bit smaller than a postage stamp. Now if you're into Japanese classics, this cannot go amiss. The big Z1, the big 900 Kawasaki. They've been famous for their two strokes of course, but this with their big four cylinder 900cc, double overhead cam and all the rest of it. Honda made, might have made the lead there with the CB750, but this was big meaty, bulletproof. All these phrases came from Kawasaki. Mega performance, the handling in those days might not have been uh, that good, but the engine, absolutely superb. Could you used to get the four separate exhausts there, but all these bikes here are immaculate. This one's a 1973, over there is a 74. This one down here got the um, Top Show Award last year, or was it second in show, I think. But look at it, it's absolutely perfect. What you'd have to do to get first in show, I don't know. And then in 76, we have this one, the Z900. And then moving it along a couple of years, Kawasaki brought out a completely different one, which is the Z1000, Z1R. Completely different styling, more European box-like thing with a little nose fairing on it. But the mechanics were still basically the same as far as the engine went, even though it's now got alloy wheels. If you think of kettles, I don't suppose you think of motorbikes, but Suzuki actually made one. 
Obviously the name Kettle was a fun name given by enthusiasts to the GT750. Simply called a Kettle because it was water-cooled. Three-cylinder two-stroke, water-cooled as I said, three carburetors with it as well. And Suzuki stuck with this design from 72 to 77. So when everyone else was going over to four-strokes, four they wanted to stick with two-strokes. Barry Sheen first rode a race version of this and made his name on them as a 750. So a hell of a performance. Normal road bike, probably good for 115, 120 max, and about 70 brake horsepower. But it was a bike of its time, and that one's an immaculate one. This week's question then is, if you could ride pillion with anybody in the world, who would it be and why? I'm not a great lover of being pillion, but I suppose it'd have to be some of the greats like Foggy, Hogson, people like that, or even Barry Sheen. <laughs> One from the past. Neil Hodson, um, because he doesn't fall off like Chris Walker. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he's a, he's a much improved rider. Brilliant. I'm afraid that uh, it wouldn't be a sports rider, it'd have to be Susie Perry. <laughs> and don't ask me why. <laughs> Mel Gibson. Because <laughs> he's better looking than Carl Fogarty for definite. And um, he's just gorgeous. Probably Michaela Fogarty. <laughs> <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, but failing that, um, yeah, it'd have to be. Um, <clears throat> It'd have to be my little darling over there, wouldn't it? I can't say any more than that. <laughs> <laughs> Might should have a spot for choice, actually, because it'd either have to be Tom Miedo, James Hayden on his R7, or Nori Okiaga on an R7. He's the boy. And one thing that you often see at shows is special, especially a classic show, but there's a special here, and I've never seen anything like this. This is a V8 Kawasaki, a 1600cc, and it absolutely looks immaculate. It looks factory made, it's so good. And Alan Milliard here is the guy who made it. Alan, tell me a little bit about the, the bike. I just couldn't believe seeing that engine. I mean, did you actually cast the crankcases or what? No, the engine's made from two separate engines that have been cut into segments and rewelded back together. To make, You've to got a like smile cartons. on your face, but that's the truth, is it? Yeah, yeah hand filed and hand sawn with hank saws. Oh my God! So you've done all this at home? Yeah, in the garage. No milling machines. It's all done by hand. And how long did it take you? From start to finish, 12 weeks. I've done 1,620 miles yeah. since it was built. It's been to the Isle of Man TT. It's been over to France, to Paris, to the Coupes de Motel Yeah. Several track days, and I use it for work, and it runs great. Now you think three-cylinder engines these days and you probably think of Triumphs. Well, there is another bike around with a three-cylinder engine, or there was, Laverda. They had a big three, introduced in 1973, and then some brothers over in Hereford called Slater Brothers, they tuned one, they called it the Jota. 1,000cc three-cylinder engine. Also brought out a 1,200, which they called the Mirage, but you can bring it bang up to date yourself and end up with something like this one. This Spondon frame beauty, and I've just knocked his little badge off the front, but we'll stick that back on. 1116cc on this one because it's been bored out. There goes his little sticker again. JMC swinging arm, it's got Spondon alloy tank. Looks an absolute picture. It doesn't look at all dated, does it? So it might be a classic bike, but a, a future classic perhaps in this one. 
Now that famous British name Norton, they did something in the early 80s which was quite revolutionary and that's not a crummy pun because they introduced a rotary engine. This was seen in police bikes more commonly on the road. They also made a road bike called the Commander, but you didn't see too many of those. But they did race them. And Trevor Nation, he was British Superbike Championship twice, I reckon, on these. Here's an example of the F1, their race bike. And another one there, you can't really see the engine, it's buried down in there. But it was nominally 600cc and they used a twin rotor engine. Just over here, if we can get it on shot, there's a bit of a customised job here. Don't think much of the paint scheme, but you can see the engine in all its glory. Big air-cooled twin rotor job. But down here is the interesting bit, if you're a bit of a mechanical anorak like I am. But this is the rotary engine, the internals of it. You just see the one rotor here. There you've got the inlet, so there's no valves on this. There's the inlet, here's the rotor. This spins round, so if I can spin it, well, I'll turn it that way round. So you, sucks in there, creates a depression, sucks in the mixture, goes round there, up there is the spark plug, compresses it, goes bang, then carries the gas round here and squirts it out down there. Now one of the big problems with these, not only was this shaft very complicated as you can see, but it also had this rotor here, this three-cornered rotor, and these were the seals. So no piston rings on this, but actually seals, and those are the things that used to wear, and so uh, used to use a lot of oil and uh, not that reliable at the end of the day. Great pity, but uh, a classic experiment. Now, if I asked you to think of a bike name, would Lilac be up there in those names? I very much doubt it. Well, the Japanese didn't think like that in 1959 because they produced this, the Lilac 250. Beautiful piece of work it is. Look at these lovely castings on here, integral gearbox and crankcase. 250cc, air-cooled, push rod overhead valve. Very, very modern. Shaft drive to the rear wheel, as you can see, very much like a BMW, swinging arm rear suspension. Silences and exhaust are very much like a BMW. And so is this seat here. Early BMWs had a seat like this, independently sprung. But a very neat little bike and a bit of a rarity. I've, I've read about them, but I've never seen one before. And you could say the same for this. This is a Yongi. Now, I would have thought from the look of the name on the tank that that is Japanese or Chinese. Well, it's not, it's French. And just to give some idea of the way people restore these bikes, this one was actually found um, on a lay-by on a dual carriageway near Chester, would you believe? But the guy found it and tracked down the original manufacturer and all the rest of it and rebuilt it. Little 250cc two-stroke going back to 1953. An amazing piece of work. Looks a fairly classic dashboard. Well, it does, except for that up there. See that? Boost. That's the boost gauge because this is a turbocharged bike. A Kawasaki from 1984, GPZ750 Turbo. You can't see the turbo, it's down at the front of the engine. Just see a bit of the pipe work there. This one's absolutely immaculate. But all the Japanese manufacturers played with turbos in the mid 80s, and Suzuki did one too. And this is it. This is Suzuki's slant on a turbocharged bike. The XN85, just to mislead you, because in fact this is just a 650cc4 with the turbo stuck up at the back there. But turbos didn't last for long. Unlike this one next to it, Suzuki's Katana. You might well have seen quite a few of these around if you can hear me over the PA. This styling, in fact, was Euro styling done by a German company called Target Design. But it still kept a certain sort of modernity to it. You can see all this edge styling all along here. So it kept it nice and modern. GSXR motor in there, and they did a 550, 750, 1000, and 1100, which is this one. And to me, it still looks a fairly modern bike. Now Yamaha, of course, they made the name with two strokes in the road world as well as the racing world. But then in the early 70s, they decided to make a, a step into the four-stroke world and they came up with this, the XS650. Parallel twin, overhead cam, very much in a traditional style. It could almost be British, except this had the standard Japanese things of more reliability and being oil tight. And it had a very sound following, very sound engine, gave a good performance, good, reliable, simple bike. Now down in front of me here, it's a CBX double overhead cam, 24 valves. Why 24 valves? Because this is a six cylinder. And looking down here, the rider's eye view, very unusual to see cylinders sticking out from under the tank. Absolutely massive. But when this was introduced in 1978, it really was quite something, a big six cylinder air-cooled motor when everyone was just getting used to four cylinders. But even though this one might be getting on now, people don't always leave them alone. This one next to me here, this one's been done up very neatly, 916 exhaust system put on, 
and also a TDM fairing at the front. Looks very professional and very neat. And there's yet more. Look at this one for a start off, or sort of a second off as it were. Single sided swinging arm on there, and this was homemade, home crafted. And it's also got a six pipe exhaust system up there, like the pipes of Pan. Just see the pipes running across the back of the bike. I understand there's no baffles in there either, but we won't tell anyone. This one next to it as well, this beautiful creation here. Another homemade exhaust system, you can see them swept up there. Bodywork off of VFR 750. The tank made up from Fireblade tanks, two of them. But it makes a really neat job and puts a little bit different on there. Different swinging arm, of course. And then wrap it up with this one, a Moto Martin, which were a French company who made a lot of um, CBX specials with their frames. And there it is, that finishes off. So just because you've got a sort of old classic bike, it doesn't have to stay that way. And on two wheels next week, Jeff takes a ride on Suzuki's latest muscle bike, the GSX 1400. The same size engine as a small family car, but infinitely more fun. Also next week, our very own off-road expert Wayne travels to the Sheffield Indoor Arena for some high-energy, fast-moving supercross action. <laughs>